Uh, my name is Captain Byron Adams, and I want to do a video series for the Dark Raffle Way of War. And we're just going to call it the Planes of Warfare and I.O., uh, specifically information operations. Really just wanted to kind of take a moment and really explain what I.O. is, what information operation is, and really how it plays into just modern warfare and how we um, are kind of changing the U.S. Army to ch uh, fight in a different airway than we have in the past. So I kind of want to start off with a quick quote. Um, it's from a guy named Sun Tzu. And everybody talks about this a lot. It's a very common, very, uh, very common quote. But in this instance, we don't really understand it, I think, at a deeper level. And the, really the course of this whole next couple videos that we're gonna do is really just to dive deeply into understanding what this quote means. So it goes like this. Know yourself and know your enemy. In a hundred battles, you will never peril. So we know this quote is talked about a lot. We've seen it in a lot of just army publications, a lot of army doctrines, a lot of just things throughout the military. It's very, very common and it seems very inspiring, but we really, I'm, I don't believe the US Army really understands how to, how to make this a reality, right? So we always talk about knowing yourself, but really the purpose of this series is really to know your enemy. And I want to talk about it more than just like a physical domain, like they have tanks, they have guns, they have weapons. Um, the U.S. Army these days does a lot of work just to try to understand those types of things. But I want to talk about something a little bit different. I want to talk about their mind. Really, we want to talk about fighting over what matters. I want to talk about the enemy's will to fight. You see, U.S. doctrine and joint doctrine will always say that this is the number one goal that we should fight for. But I find it interesting that because it is the number one goal, there is no joint definition. There is no army definition. In fact, if you go to the RAND website, you will find that they themselves do not have a definition for the will to fight. So how is it that the US Army is supposed to combat an enemy's will to fight, yet we cannot define what the will to fight is? If we look at an enemy and we try to understand all of their capabilities, their weapons, their tanks, everything around them, it all comes down to one thing, the human side of warfare. Um, we try to look at things in the Dark Rivals a little bit differently than most others. We look at things from a cognitive domain. We try to look at things from that human will to fight, from a maneuverist standpoint. And so I really want to take some time for the next couple of videos to really describe what is somebody's will to fight and how do we as the U.S. Army combat in that space? So, like I said, the RAND publication, they do not have a definition. RAND, a very high, highly funded, highly, pro, uh, highly funded, full of a lot of smart people, and they themselves don't have a definition. So let me try to just give you my own definition, right? So I think it's the will to fight can be measured in four different ways. Fear, depression, sense of well-being, and finally death. I am not the smartest person in the room, but this is my best attempt to try to define or try to give some sort of metrics to an enemy's will to fight. So we really, I took a look at this from like a Maslow's hierarchy, and I felt that if you can try to get a sense of these four characteristics, you can start to affect an enemy's will to fight. So the fun thing about will to fight is that it's extremely hard to define. Nobody in the US military has done it definitively. But at the same time, it's easy to measure. So how is it that we're able to measure somebody's will to fight? In concrete details on the battlefield. The number, there's basically two ways. Way number one, how many POWs or prisoners of war have you captured? Number two, how many AWOLs does the enemy commander have in his formation? When you think about these two things, it starts to give you a glimpse at where the enemy is willing to fight. If they're not willing to fight, they will surrender. If they're not willing to fight, they will run away. 
And if you and if you is if your enemy has all the machine guns in the world, all the tanks, all the artillery, but yet none of their people are willing to stand and fight, then you have effectively won the battle, right? And it goes back to this: know yourself, know your enemy. In a hundred battles, you will never perish. So if you can understand where mentally the enemy is at, and you can affect them in that manner, you effectively do not have to fire them. Now, that is very grandiose in a lot of thoughts, in a lot of ways, and I'm not going to try to, uh, to, to, to say that this is a, a, a way to end wars. What this merely is, is a way to affect and tilt the tides of war into your favor. So instead of having to fight 100 people, you fight 70. Instead of having to fight a brigade, you, for, you fight a brigade minus. You fight a degraded enemy in many different aspects. And the thing about uh, the will to fight and fear, depression, sense of well-being, all of those things, they're contagious and they will spread amongst the formation and it will create fear and doubt within that organization and eventually you'll have an easier time winning on the battlefield. So, how does any of this have to do with IO? So I know most soldiers in the United States military are not super familiar with IO. It's a newer concept that's been around for the last 10 years or so and it's starting to gain traction. I myself am an IO officer. I've been trained in the schoolhouse. Um, I hold the categories. So I want to just give you a quick brief look at what the IO model is and what it's all about. So the IO model. So we pull this from our field manual, FM 313, called Information Operations. You're more than welcome to look it up yourself, but there's one key factor in this manual that I want you guys to understand. If you can understand this one model, it'll help you give an understanding of what we're trying to explain here. So in a previous video, Chaplain Sanders has done a video on the planes of war. And that's why we tell this, the planes of war in Iowa. So this concept is not old. In fact, it's been around for quite some time. But what I'm really trying to do is explain that. Even though it's been around for a while, this is the U.S. military, the U.S. Army's modern interpretation of the planes of war. So what is that model? So let me just draw it for you real quick. So you have something called the cognitive domain. You also have something called the physical domain. And finally, the third one you have is called the information domain. Now, The thing about all these is that they all affect each other in some form or fashion. They don't act independently. They all interrelate in some way, shape, or fashion. And as we go through these next couple of videos, I'm going to dive deeply into each one of these domains. But I want you to keep a couple things in mind, right? If our goal, and this is stated by U.S. military doctrine, is to degrade the enemy's will to fight, we need to understand first, where does the will to fight reside? Is it in the physical domain, the information domain, or is it in the cognitive domain? And I would argue that it is in the minds of the combatants. If you can affect them, you can change outcomes. So I want to take a quick history lesson real quick and show you guys why this is so effective, why this is important. What makes this different from everything else that we do, right? We've had mixed su success in the Middle East. And I think that's a shame, right? There was a U.S. doctrine, a U.S. way of doing warfare that we used to call hearts and minds. So hearts and minds, when you look at it, has, sounds okay, but it has gotten a really bad rap sheet, unfortunately. I will not try to defend it, but what I will try to do is explain what right should look like in these further videos, and then explain to you what history shows us, right? So, for instance, we need to understand some parts of history. So let's look at a couple different examples of where affecting the cognitive domain makes warfare easier for you. So first off, the Assyrian Empire. These folks lasted, or these folks were around back uh, in the biblical era, around 1000 BC, a little bit earlier in that time frame. They were extremely feared during that period of history. Um, they affected the minds of the combatants around them to a degree that has not been seen for quite some time. If you were captured by an Assyrian in a combat situation, you'd be flayed alive, run, uh, ran through, a, uh, be flayed alive, 
you'd be rammed on a spike, and the entire methodology of warfare was based on fear and, and aggression and just completely obliterating any enemy that stood in their way. And so because of these tactics and methods, they seem barbaric to us today, but just take for a moment, take your own 21st century cultures and, and backgrounds and take yourself aside for a second. Just think about what effect that had on the enemies that they fought. They were so ruthless and efficient in their methodology of warfare that it created such a shock factor in the enemy that they were unable to effectively uh, combat these series because they were so terrified of what would happen for them. And because of this terrified fear, it created a snowball effect where the Assyrians would win battles after battles after battles. And they then began to have a reputation for being completely ruthless and never losing, never conceding defeat. It took several hundred years before they finally encountered any sort of defeat. And it wasn't until that time that they were finally overthrown and everything else like that. But just think for a matter, for a moment, when you walk into a place and the very first thing you see is an Assyrian soldier, you're terrified. And that is the effect that you want to have. Your ability to beat him might be equal, but your mind tells you no. Another example, everybody loves him, the Spartan Empire. We can all think of the movie 300, and it's a great example in some regards, right? 300 soldiers versus an entire army defending a pass, but they had a couple things going for them, right? After the battle in real life, they had a reputation for toughness, for extreme discipline, um, and it's something that pervaded the entire culture. And so when you think about the Spartans, even to this day, it is well past 2,500, 3,000 years, whatever it's been since the Spartan military has been around. It's something that is still pervasive in our own culture because they had such a reputation of winning fights, winning battles, taking no prisoners, things of that nature, that we still talk about them to this very day. Right? Another empire, the Romans, right? We all know you can talk about military capabilities, their efficiency in combat, their discipline of their soldiers, etc., etc., etc. But I want to give you an example of one way that they kept and maintained power, right? Crucifixion, right? Think about it this way. If your best friend is going to be crucified up on a stake, it's one of the most gruesome ways to die. There aren't very many other ways that are worse than crucifixion. But think about it this way. If, if they, the Romans, understood at a fundamental level what crucifixion does, not just to the person, because that wasn't their main target audience. They did this in public settings. They would do crucifixions to affect the minds of the entire population, to suppress revolution, to suppress any sort of riots and things of that nature. So the Romans would do things like this. They were doing it in such a way as to, one, show their superiority, but also at the same time, uh, suppress any sort of resistance to their empires, right? Let me take another example. I love these ones, the Mongols. Many times famed as having the largest empire, the largest land empire the world has ever seen. Genghis Khan has been touted by many as one of the most military uh, geniuses that the world has ever produced. But the thing about the Mongols is interesting, though, is they were always outnumbered. They always fought, um, not on their home turf most of the time. They were always fighting somewhere else, invading. But they were able to get so many uh, kingdoms, so many princes to pay them tribute. They were able to get them to submit to their will, even though the Mongols were outnumbered. Now, yes, I know the historians out there can say, well, they had these great bows, and they were all horsemen, and such and such and such. Yes, all of that is true. But I want to take just a moment and think about the mental state that the Mongols would put their subjects within, right? So, the Mongols. If you defied the Mongol, and your city decided to garrison up and try to defend yourselves, the Mongols would come... And when they defeated you, which, mind you, they had a reputation for winning every single battle they almost ever went in. When they defeated you, they didn't just kill the kings and the knights or whoever the, the royalty was at that point in time. No, they slaughtered the entire town. The entire town. Now, again, distance yourself from your 21st century brain and don't try to place your own modern values on what was back then. That was a normal occurrence. But the Mongols did it to a tenth degree. Right? They would slaughter the entire city. Additionally, before they even took the city, they would, lob, they would sever the heads off of enemy commanders, enemy combatants, and lob those into the cities as a fear factor. One of the first instances of psychological warfare that is highly recorded and very interesting to study, right? When you think about the Mongols and you think about how they subjugated, how they affected the mind, when you see a friend's head in your place or rolling through the streets after in, the, in a city that you're besieged in, it has a mental effect on you. It degrades your will to fight, right? I want to talk about another one, right? And this one's kind of a little bit different. 
So SEAL Team 6 versus Delta Force. So we could all have arguments, and I know there's going to be someone out there that's going to say, oh, SEAL Team 6 is the best, no, Delta is the best. But I want you to think for a moment. They're probably both very, very good, right? In fact, they are both very, very good. But the thing about SEAL Team 6 is they get a lot more press. How many more Hollywood movies show SEAL Team 6 versus the Delta Force? Now, the fun thing is Delta recruits out of SEAL Team 6. So only the best of SEAL Team 6 and the best of SEALs get into Delta. But at the same time, they get talked about more. So why are they more feared than Delta Force? I think you can make an argument that Delta is superior in many ways when you really look at it. But from a mental standpoint, SEAL Team 6 is more feared because they are the ones that are publicized. They're the ones that people hear about. They're the ones in Hollywood. They're the ones that bring fear when you need fear to be a weapon. Uh, the final one I want to talk about is ISIS. And these guys, right? Masters at uh, social media in many ways. Um, but they would do things as well, right? They would behead soldiers. They would behead uh, combatants that they were not friendly with. They would burn people alive. And all of these things were meant to degrade somebody's will to fight, right? So in a modern context, we Americans, when we fight, we're going to capture a POW, and we're going to fairly treat them, right? Which is a great thing. But other folks, that's not the case. And so when you think about it from a, a will to fight, that is an interesting concept, right? It degrades somebody's willingness to want to fight. Now this can go in many ways. Obviously, it can drive some people to be put into a corner and force them to do things that they might not normally do, fight to the death and things of that nature. But think about it for a second. Once you start building these reputations, it changes the perception that enemies have of you. So, finally, I just have a couple more thoughts before we conclude this video. But I want you to think about something as we're wrapping this up. How is it that we weaponize fear in the 21st century, right? How do we do that while still maintaining our integrity, still maintaining our, our, our ability to sleep well at night without committing atrocities and war crimes? How do we weaponize that? Because almost every example I gave you, minus the SEAL Team 6, was full of atrocities, what would be considered today modern atrocities. So how do we as the US Army evolve ourselves to strike fear, to affect the enemy's will to fight, while at the same time weaponizing fear and being able to sleep at night. So the last thought I want you guys to walk away with is the all of the war fighting functions, right? So if you look at joint publication, you'll find that the, uh, the joint publications list eight war fighting functions. So if you look at them all, they all have, you know, you have maneuver and intelligence and protection and you have uh, sustainment, all of those different warfighting functions. But the, when you look at mission command, but when you look at the whole thing, you have one that sits on the outside. And they call it information. And they draw a circle around the whole thing to indicate that information encompasses all of the warfighting functions. It needs to be nested within all the different aspects that the US military uh, accomplishes, right? So I want you to think for a moment as we talk a little bit further in this series about how the will to fight equates to information. And how do we affect all of the war fighting functions to change the enemy's will to fight? So with that ado, we're gonna head on next into the next video. Uh, we're gonna talk about the physical planes or the sorry, the physical dimension of warfare, the physical dimension of IO. We're gonna dive deeply into that. So until next time, hop race scale.